Hello, people of internet. This is 488 episode chat with Healthcare Foundation India. Our respect and love to Dr. KK. Health Patrol will bring you another episode of Factor Check. And this week, we will clear apprehensions around vaccine and other fake COVID news. Today, we have with us Dr. Gurda Chaudhary. Dr. Gurda, Chairman of Department of Gastrointestinal Medical Science Forest Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon. Our guest is also an avid columnist and public health expert. Hi. Sir, would you like to say something before we start the show? Yeah, I think that, you know, everybody is at the moment very, very worried about COVID and about all the issues relating to it and vaccination. And I would like to start by paying my homage to Dr. K.K. Agarwal. In fact, you know, when the COVID epidemic started in March last year, uh, towards the beginning of that, I think it was around April or May, he did a webinar. In fact, and I was one of the panelists in his webinar. And it was a huge webinar. He got together a lot of experts to give their views on how COVID was affecting different organs. And I was talking about liver and GI tract. And he, as you know, he's a very, uh, he, his breadth of knowledge was extensive. He was extremely updated, very crisp. And uh, I, I enjoyed doing that webinar with him. It was very, very sad that he has left us. And uh, I, I'll, I'll obviously not be able to measure up to what he was doing but I'll try my best. Thank you, sir. It's great to have you on the show. Before we ask the questions around flip-flops on vaccine, we would like to ask our expert about multi-system inflammatory syndrome. In the recent article you wrote for Hindustan Times, COVID-19 is affecting children, you talked about MISC. Gastrointestinal symptoms are common findings in children with SARS-CoV-2 infection including vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and difficulty in speaking. Although these symptoms tend to be mild. Could you please explain our audience how is inflammatory syndrome related to these symptoms? And what is your advice to the parents so that they can better take care of their kids? In the first wave of the epidemic, I think it's become very clear all across the world that children were not getting very much affected. You know, I mean, if you look at what was happening, it was mainly the brunt was being uh, felt by the elderly people with comorbidities somehow in the second wave and you know towards the end of the first wave it became apparent that children were also not completely immune to it quite a few were getting affected but we were not recognizing it and the reason was that their manifestation was not the very typical covid symptoms which happens in adults so in adults you know it often starts with uh, sore throat and high fever and then you go and get a RT-PCR done and it's positive and you find chest involvement because of the virus. What happened in children is a slightly different form, the one that I wrote about, the multi-system immune uh, response syndrome. There what happens is that this virus stimulates the body to produce very large amounts of antibodies. And you know, these antibodies are so much and so powerful that ultimately, even when the virus is gone, the antibodies actually keep producing a lot of problems in the body. It's a hyper explosive condition almost, you know, and it starts affecting different organs, especially kidney and the liver and the brain. So these children often present with fever, but very often there is a little bit of puffiness, there is swelling. The person becomes a little dull and comatose sometimes, you know, children. And the typical finding is that the CRP is very high. The IgG antibodies are very high. So it's a multi-system involvement due to an excess of antibodies. And I was surprised that, you know, this uh, was recognized in many places, but particularly in India from Mumbai. And the credit goes to a mother. She is the wife of a doctor. So two of her children got affected. And therefore, she went to the depths, pursued with the doctors, got the diagnosis established. And you know, there is a slightly different way of treating these children. And both her children recovered. And she has been a very active campaigner on the 
social media and that's why i thought that it's worthy of disseminating this to so many people who have children you never know what would happen in the, the second wave has seen children being affected there is a bit of speculation that the third wave might see even more children being affected and that's the reason why this particular syndrome needs to be known as well quite an interesting fact how large amount of antibodies can also be a point of concern but the optimism here is that it is treatable thank you yes. sir now second question is drug cocktail which is mixing different vaccine was given to former us president trump asian institute of gastroenterology treats 40 patients with comorbidities using a drug cocktail monoclonal therapy which is nothing but mixing different antibodies to fight particular disease studies are in progress if it can also fight highly infectious delta variant drug majors roche india and cipla have priced the antibody cocktail at 59715 rupees per dose though price seems like a concern but still sir what is your remark on this information i think that's a very promising area of research so remember whenever a new medicine comes it always comes pricey in the market but the fact of the matter is uh, for my audience i would like them to know uh, donald trump was uh, at the peak of his election campaign when he actually contracted covid and for those of you who follow the news uh, it was around the 7th or 9th day that you know he received these cocktails in a army hospital and you know in 7 or 9 days he was back on his campaign trail that was the quickness of the recovery and you know in the us the the antibody cocktail was being marketed by a company called regeneron that's why it is actually nowadays called the trump cocktail now this particular antibody cocktail is a bit different from what one might normally think these are monoclonal antibodies and monoclonal antibodies are actually produced in the lab using a different technology so they are not the same as routine antibodies for example you know in between there was this concept of using plasma therapy plasma therapy is also antibodies but taken from people who had recovered now that actually is diluted antibodies and a little widely dispersed antibodies whereas this cocktail is sharply focused to monoclonal antibodies which are targeting mainly the virus so it's a very good antiviral therapy and that's the reason why it's a bit difficult it has come to india by the way fortis is one of the places where it's being used also both in fortis escort sart institute as well as in our FMRI, that's the Fortis Medical Research Institute in Gurgaon. Uh, there are two or three things that everybody should understand. One is that this particular therapy is useful only if you use it in the very early part of the infection. So it is to be done in the first three to four days of getting COVID. Now you might ask, then why should everybody go and get a sixty thousand rupees cocktail intravenous injection every day? because after all you know we know that 90% might recover anyway so it's specifically kept for people who are elderly and or people who have comorbidities where the chances are that this covid infection can tumble down and they might actually become severe covid or they may might die okay but having that said that if one really doesn't want to take any chances and if suppose very early in the stage of the disease you go and get this antibody infusions done the chances are extremely high that this viral infection will be controlled and it won't actually slide down to a severe disease so it's already in in process and it's being done the second part of your question is a very important question and i must clarify that so what happened with all the medical technology beat the vaccines or beat the antibody cocktail they were done using a particular strain of a virus so that brings me to this question of what are the different strains you know so the alpha chain strain the beta strain you know the delta is the one which is the top of the town so whenever you develop any drugs or antibodies or vaccines you do it using a particular strain of a virus 
and therefore this regenerative antibodies or the cocktail antibodies were initially made against the alpha strain which was prevalent in the united states so the controversy that is now creeping in is that will it be just as effective for the delta strain or not it will definitely be effective but whether it will be effective enough to the tune of 90 95% or not that is an open question that people are trying to address it's otherwise a very safe procedure you know they don't even admit patients you can just go and get your injection through the vein go home again go back the next day so it has to be done on a you know they call it the infusion chambers so you don't have to admit patients but in india there is a very special thing that since it's expensive and people who want to avail of insurance the insurance companies require that you need to be admitted you know and that's the reason why some people might prefer to be admitted but that's the reason otherwise the the therapy itself is not dangerous enough to require admission so did i get it right that people should not rush to the hospitals to get this antibodies because it is recommended for people who have detected covid at an early stage or people who have comorbidity so if i then might say um, she said if suppose there is somebody in your family and you know the person is 75 has got hypertension and diabetes has been through a kidney transplant for example and you know everybody is apprehensive that what might happen because if covid comes into that family he would be the most vulnerable person am i right the younger persons will not have it so if suppose he has an insurance policy or if financially they are well off and they decide that look i might like to take the precaution and give him the antibody cocktail right in the beginning and take no chances and wait for natural recovery it's one way of looking at it. so for how long can one evade the virus by taking this cocktail oh so you know once the body gets infected with the virus then you know recovery i, I mean you either recover or you don't recover i mean there are basically two options right once you recover then there is a formation of natural antibodies and that's the reason why it has been found that a second episode of covid infection is relatively uncommon so the challenge is to go through the first infection and come out with protective antibodies so that you don't go to a second stage so from that point of view it makes sense if you wish to give that a try after all all the things that were used earlier on that is the two antivirals so we had remdesivir and favipiravir all of them were basically aimed for that matter even ivermectin they were all aimed as antiviral agents okay the only problem is that you know you must understand that antiviral agents if you use it too late when the virus has already caused the damage then it doesn't seem to show much benefit so if at all you want to use an antiviral agent like a monoclonal uh, antibody cocktail it makes more sense to use it right in the beginning of the illness rather than wait for 8 or 10 days and then try it so talking about delta variant the us center for uh, disease control and prevention cdc has reclassified the delta variant first detected in india as variant of concern due to its high transmissibility CDC estimates it's accounted for 99% of cases in US as of June 5th. Mm -hmm. What concerning signal does this piece of information sends for India? Can it be a reason for third wave? Uh so it has certainly been uh, responsible for the second wave in India that I think most people would agree with because initially what happened is that it was the alpha variant that time you know it wasn't been called as alpha beta delta it was being given names according to the part of the world where it originated so i think everybody is familiar with what is known as the british strain the south african strain and the brazilian strain and the chinese strain and so on and so forth but now there has been a lot of sensitivity around giving country names to variants okay so that's why the who in its wisdom recently decided that look let's not take country names but let us give greek names to it so alpha beta gamma delta and so on so that's the way it is 
Now the problem is that much of the research part in the world went around in actually Europe, England, and America. And that's the place where basically it was the alpha strain which was predominant. So much of our trials were done on alpha strains and we thought that we had learned how to manage the alpha strain, both with regard to the vaccines as well as with the monoclonal antibodies and so on and so forth. Right? Now what happened is that this particular virus seems to be undergoing mutations which cause it to change its antigenic profile. Okay. And why does the virus do it? The virus does it because it wants to escape from what human beings are making by way of drugs or antibodies or vaccines. So it wants to escape. It wants more freedom. Okay, So that's the tussle that we are in at this point in time. Certainly, the question that should come to everybody's mind is that when in India, the numbers were dropping in the winter of 2020, say January, February of 21, we almost thought that we had overcome uh, COVID infections. And then it came back with a huge surge. The surge was so bad, it was absolutely terrifying and tearful. I mean, you can't imagine every day we would be woken up with 10 phone calls, everybody desperate, wanting an ICU bed or oxygen. And, you know, it was uh, terrible. Everybody known to us, I'm sure all of us have people in families or people that we know who have lost their lives. Now, obviously, this wave was different from the other waves, the first wave. And then people found that this virus had mutated and therefore it had become what is now known as a Delta variant. So it had undergone a change in its antigenic profile. Now, this particular strain or the Delta strain uh, has been found to be far more infective or contagious than the first one. And that's the reason why so many people suddenly had the infection. Earlier on, it wasn't so bad. Okay. And the question that was still vexing people is that, is it only that it's more contagious or is it also more likely to be more serious? That is where a little bit of conflict is still going on. I mean, if you ask me, I'll tell you what the conflict is. But contagiousness, I think that WHO has agreed that, yeah, it is certainly much more contagious. And when a virus is very contagious and it starts spreading, you know, it tends to displace the other virus strains of that area. So right now, the in England, they have displaced the alpha strain largely replaced it so the delta is becoming the predominant strain and the same is happening in the us so obviously it's raising a lot of concern if you want so, me to spell out the concern i'll do that so what sir, is it a concern for india or india has already overcome that concern by fighting this delta variant I'll tell you, after the second wave, when we actually were taught a bad lesson that never be complacent with a virus, I would hesitate to say that it's over for India. Because you see, now, uh, those of you who are following the news, you know that there was yesterday a discussion about what is known as a Delta Plus variant. So this virus is going to go on mutating and keep changing its coat or character. So what it will lead to in the next few months, I, I dare speculate. I don't think we should do that, especially after the fiasco that happened with the second. So my next question to you, Bharat Biotech co-vaccine has not been approved by either WHO or FDA in USA as the manufacturer has still not shared phase three trial data. Some foreign countries are even considering Indian students vaccinated with co-vaccine as unvaccinated. Does this mean that the people in India should not get co-vaccine jabs? So, uh, uh, you know, I'll just take two minutes to explain to people what these different vaccines are all about. So remember that there are three vaccines which are very popular all over the world now. One is called the Covishield vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, Oxford AstraZeneca. You know, always when you add a foreign name, it appears more respectable. So it's the Oxford AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine. The other is called the Sputnik V or 5 vaccine, which is the Russian vaccine. And the third is a JJ vaccine. That is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. 
remember that these three vaccines have a similar similar technology so they use another virus called the adenovirus and they put the coronavirus antigen on it and then they introduce it into the body all three use the same technology the other two vaccines which are very popular in the world especially in america are basically the pfizer and the moderna vaccines they use a different technology called the mrna or the messenger rna technology it's a different technology and of course we have the covaxin which is a different old technology it's actually called the inactivated virus technology okay now remember that the moderna and the pfizer vaccines were built around the premise that there is a part of the virus called the spike protein and that protein so in pictures you will see it as the red little thing which is kind of projecting out of the ball so that protein is the one which goes and attaches to the human cell and that causes the infection so the mrna vaccine was found to be 95% protective and it was directed against the spike protein now what do you do if the virus mutates and the delta virus decides to change the spike protein characteristic and that is what's the biggest fear in the united states right now that you know the pfizer vaccine which was thought to be 95% may not actually be 95% protective against the delta variant okay now i'll come to the other question that you asked me between covaxin and the astrazeneca vaccine you see obviously there will be different regulations because as you very rightly gave this uh, session the name of flip flop the last word has not yet been said so each country will make its own rule first and then it will try to defend it and then it will change its rules depending on how science is evolving and how the infection is evolving as of now you are right that covaxin has not been included in the who list to an extent i wish the bharat biotech were a little more prompt in giving their data so that you know we could have stood shoulder to shoulder with the other international vaccines but now the emergency use for covaxin as a protective agent for international travel they have said especially united states that they don't recognize so now covaxin has to file for a full uh, permission not a emergency authorization but a full authorization which bharat biotech is saying that they will be able to do by july august maybe september it is putting a lot of school student uh, college students to difficulty because a lot of people you know the sessions open in september and that's the reason why they are stuck because this vaccine is not being recognized so what they are being told is that you have to now go to the united states and take one of the american vaccines the moderna or the pfizer which i wish we could have avoided in the sense we could have done with a better vaccine the covax the covishield vaccine was initially in the list now there are certain countries which are actually also derecognizing it in some ways so now this is a huge area of flip flop which is going to go on i don't think the last word has been said and i think we'll have to keep playing depending on the rules which pertain at that particular time remember that when people take make rules they are also doing it based on the evidence which is available at that point in time and very often two weeks later the rules may change but it is a matter of concern i wish we had been a bit more prompt yeah so after the discussion i would like to ask is is there a possibility is there a possibility okay I'll just call that hello hello yeah, can ahead. you hear yes so is there a possibility that a person who has already taken co vaccine or covid shield can actually apply for a different vaccine or will there be some consequences related to it sorry i missed that part can you come again anshika yes sir sir i was asking if a person has already taken covid shield or vaccine can the person take another vaccine like you already mentioned pfizer or moderna or will there be any consequences that a person can face so uh, as of now i don't think we need to be worried about taking a third vaccine uh, and in fact uh, according to the chief of the niti ayog uh, dr paul you know when there was a 
what one might consider a mishap that in one of the small villages in up they had run out of the stock of one vaccine so they gave the second dose of the other vaccine so initially it was covishield and then they gave, gave covaxin so the bureaucrats and health authority i mean the authorities thought it was a big crime but actually dr paul said that it was inadvertently probably a good thing because you know there is something called a mix and match vaccine so if you take two types you are probably improving the immunity better so i personally think that taking the third vaccine is not a problem health wise the major concern has been initially that people were struggling with the cost and just about trying to see if they can get their two doses but i think taking a third is not a problem but the cost will be the problem because the pfizer and moderna are more expensive <clears throat> And so, what about the reactions that one would face after those vaccines? We have been uh, listening about AEFI cases. As per the Union Health Ministry, twenty-six thousand two hundred AEFI, which is adverse event following immunization, have been reported from twenty-three point five crore vaccine doses administered across the country from sixteen Jan to seven Jan, which is point one percent of total jabs administered. 4,230 cases had comorbidities, and a total of 488 deaths were reported after vaccination. Out of those 26,200 cases, which is 0.01 percent of the total cases reported, most of these cases have been found in women and people above 51. The question is twofold: How big is the risk according to you of getting vaccinated? Is it correct to tag all deaths post vaccination to the vaccine itself? Very good question. So let me put it this way: <clears throat> Does this vaccine have any risk? That is, you know, is it completely safe or is it associated with adverse effects? So the answer is that obviously it has adverse effects. So there is no denying the fact that it's it has got a little bit of chances of side effects. Number two. how bad are the side effects in the sense that you know what proportion has it so as you very rightly said the figure comes to roughly about 0.1% or something and severe adverse effects and death is actually 0.0002% okay that's the figure now what do you have to compare it against the comparison is that if one gets covid infection okay then the chances of becoming serious critical or dying is close to around 2% now 2% and 0.001% or 2% it's almost a 100 or a 1000 fold difference so it's a question of which one would you prefer would you rather wait that if you got the infection you would come out but remember the risk of dying is 2% or whether you would take the vaccine albeit knowing that there can be side effects and then take the risk and protect yourself so that's the million dollar question the other part that you mentioned was about uh, you know why i mentioned about the adenovirus vaccine you know the covi shield and the jj vaccine and the sputnik v so most of this abnormal clotting which happened because of which six uh, women died in the uk and a few died in uh, europe and you know so on and so forth and about a few by the way died in uh, us also with the jj vaccine this particular side effect profile was associated with the adenovirus based vaccine so jj covi shield and sputnik v okay but even then i would say that the risk is actually quite small 0.0002% you know so if you have no other option but this is the vaccine available i would say go ahead and take it are the other vaccines totally safe the idea is no so let me give you information on data when pfizer vaccine started rolling out and you know they first administ i mean one of the places where they administered it was to elderly people in elderly homes you know so these were the people of 80s and 90s with alzheimers multiple comorbidities and so on in an america in a uh, european scandinavian hospital 23 people died and you know it was mainly because if they had fever or if they had rigors at night their body's ability to cope was so little that they passed away 
so they were tottering but you know the question is then should you have given it to these elderly people the other way of looking at it is that they are the ones who are most vulnerable to have covid and covid related deaths so a whole lot of people who died in basically italy and spain before it went on to england were actually people in that age group you know with comorbidities so it's a very catch 22 situation i mean i personally think there is no ideal vaccine but yes if you are caught between the devil and the deep blue sea it's probably better to take the vaccine and hope for the best and get some degree of protection because the vaccine does give some degree of protection our expert Have clearly recommends everyone to take the vaccine because the risk is quite limited numbers well projected sir but uh, talking about uh talking about a case first death was confirmed due to anaphylaxis following covid vaccination this news is all over we would like to ask you what is anaphylaxis should it be a point of concern and who carries a higher risk so anaphylaxis is an extreme form of allergic reaction so you know uh, that's the most extreme form so you suddenly get a lot you know so that's what happens it's called anaphylaxis can you hear me now we can hear you sir am i audible no yes okay sorry so that's called anaphylaxis no anaphylaxis can occur with almost any injection you know earlier on it used to happen when we were giving penicillin injections to patients and so on and so forth so it's a bit unpredictable it can happen to anybody and if there is a person who has a history of severe allergic reactions he is usually advised not to take this vaccine but that particular person who died he had that most unfortunate anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine and he succumbed there are quite a few other side effects which can also occur so they are basically called adverse effects you know serious adverse effects so they are also dangerous but this am i so audible? let's talk about something positive yes sir you no, no. are let's talk about something positive us no, based novavax has partnered with ua us based no, novavax has partnered with pune based vaccine manufacturer serum institute of india the vaccine would be called covavax it claims an efficacy of 90.4% after the third clinical trial and it would be priced at 1114 per dose what is your remark is this a new hope for india so there it is a new hope but you know this new hopes are going to keep coming so you have to understand that this virus is going to keep changing and therefore you will have to keep chasing the virus each time it tends to mutate and that is not going to be easy so all the elderly people who are watching this show they know that you know around the uh, month of september october november all elderly people are advised to take their influenza shots called the flu shots and every year they have to take it and those flu shots are made every year new because you know it depends on the prevalent strains available that particular year in that community so i have a feeling that covid is also going to move in that direction so whatever you do today like if you made a beautiful vaccine against say the alpha strain and then you found that it mutated so then you will actually have to chase it and make or you know add something which would also cover the mutated strain so that whole exercise is going to go on i, I think for the next few years it won't be so easy so talking about the reactions and um, risk associated with vaccination two health workers reported mild adverse effect after receiving covid-19 vaccine shot at charak palika hospital in delhi on saturday said a senior official of the new delhi municipal council he reported a slight tightness in chest during the observation is it okay to feel the heaviness in the chest after covid-19 vaccination you know i mean ideally if you don't feel it it's better but to be honest 
all the people who got vaccinated, including in our hospital here, you know, the healthcare workers were offered the vaccine first, and we all got vaccinated. So the way our bodies responded was quite different. So one of my colleagues, he had fever for five days, fairly high grade, you know, up to 101. I did. I had fever only that night. So few other people had pain in the uh, limb. So that's a little variable, and it's very difficult to predict. But as long as most of them are mild, it's OK. So what the recommendation has been that after you take the vaccine, you are supposed to stay on in the vaccination center for at least 30 minutes. And that is to watch for any se severe side effects. You know, like you shouldn't have too much tightness. You shouldn't collapse. The blood pressure shouldn't fall. You shouldn't get hives or urticaria or anaphylaxis. Now, that's about the maximum that can be done. Now, after that, if you go home and then if you have a problem, uh, it's a little bad luck. But you know what I tell my patients is that usually carry some paracetamol with you. So if you feel feverish, take it at night and also carry an anti-allergic with you. If you feel hives or itching, take it at night. Because that time you may not be able to call the doctor, you know. So these are just normal, commonsensical uh, things that, you know, people can hope to do. But if you say, are you sure that it will not happen with any vaccine? That's not possible. It will happen with almost any vaccine. The reactions are associated to all the vaccines. Make sure that you get administered yeah. at least for 30 minutes after vaccination. Carry your paracetamol and anti-allergic medicines. So next question, how long should one wait post-COVID-19 to resume rigorous exercise regime? Also, can one immediately exercise after taking vaccine shots? So the recommendation now is that after COVID uh, and you have recovered from COVID, you should give the body a little bit of time to recover. And you know, uh, recovery doesn't mean that the fever is gone, so you're normal. It is actually not normal. In fact, today in my OPD, I had at least three people who after they had recovered from COVID or they thought they had recovered and the RT-PCR was negative, they still had problems. Their CRP was high, their IL-6 was high, their liver enzymes were high. So you have to understand that, you know, this lingering effect does last for a longish period of time. And in case if you're, uh, read, I mean, uh, the audience wants to know why. So let me just clarify. There are two parts to the infection. The first part is what the virus was doing. So when the RT-PCR has turned negative, it only tells you that the virus has gone from the throat and the nose. But what the virus did was it actually generated an immune uh, reaction in the body, which is called as a cytokine storm. So a huge outpouring of antibodies and you know the, the immune response of the body. Now that cytokine storm takes time to settle down. And that's the reason why even after they have recovered from COVID, that's they have become negative. Find that the CRP is still lingering on. So that kind of a thing does happen. So overall, the advice now is, is that don't, don't be in a hurry to get back to vigorous exercise. Globally, probably three months is a good time for the body to recover. And that's probably a little on the extra cautious side, but I think it's good because quite a few people I have heard have come to harm by trying to go into very high intensity exercise very soon and they have had problems with the heart. So three months quite seems to be good for the audience. Yeah. Sorry. I was just saying that it is quite an advice for our audience and all the fitness enthusiasts present there. So are there any health red flags for COVID-19 survivors? If the survivor took the vaccine sooner than 19 days of the recovery, as was advised, is he at a higher risk? So if he has survived after taking the vaccine, I guess you can forget about it. But the recommendation now is that, you know, after you have come out of COVID, don't rush in to take the vaccine because your body anyway has antibodies. And if you get this antibody test and it's a blood test, 
you will find that the, uh, uh, the values are pretty high. So what you are trying to achieve by taking a vaccine is again to build up antibodies, which you do not require. So the overall advice is that wait for three months till you resume your vaccination, either the second dose, if you haven't taken the second one or start with the first. But three months is what's been generally advised. So next question is about taking one dose of vaccine. After a single dose of Pfizer, 79% of people had quantifiable neutralizing antibody response against the origin strain. But this fell to 50% for alpha variant B117, 32% for Delta, and 25% for Beta variant, which was first discovered in South Africa. Clearly, Pfizer has projected de decreasing efficacy for the variant. Does this indicate that India should reconsider its plan of importing foreign COVID vaccine? And second, what about the protection provided by single dose of Indian vaccines? Whenever there is a, a you know a new agent that comes in, either a vaccine or any form of therapy, it is mandated that you should do local clinical trials because you know there is a lot of variation. One is with the germ. So the virus strain can be different. And the other is that our ethnicity, that is our ability to respond also is different. So uh, just to add a little spice to the story that you told me, I, this is for your audience. You know, one of the vaccines which has been otherwise popular across the world, they wanted to also market it in South Africa. And the South African government did the trials in their place because, as you very rightly said, they have a different strain. And they found that it was not effective against that strain. Whereas this particular vaccine was very effective in other parts where the strains were different. And that's the reason why when you want to offer protection to your people, you can't just go by published data of one vaccine manufactured in one country and tested in that country. What you are talking right now about the Pfizer vaccine, yes, it has been a matter of concern for all of us that if it was 95% protective against all strains, then the question of importing it to India would have been only the logistics because, you know, it requires to be kept at minus 70. But if it is not so effective against the predominant strain in India as of now or what might happen in the future, then obviously it calls for a recalibration of the strategy. So you have to be all the time monitoring as to what is happening. So our advice to the officials is that they should actually carry out the clinical trials properly and see if the vaccine is best suited for the Indian people. Am I right, sir? Uh, you are perfectly right. So if I might just add in, the Covaxin trial was done in India with Indian patients. Okay. The other trial that was done for Covishield was partly done in India, but the larger part of the trial was actually done in England. At that point, we thought that it's fine because after all that time, the predominant strain was the alpha strain in England and the same strain in northern India. So we thought it would work. But if you now look at the Sputnik vaccine, the Sputnik vaccine has been done against the Russian uh, strain in Russia. And therefore, the Dr. Reddy's lab has had to undertake a little bit of a trial in India to establish its efficacy in India against the Indian strain. So that's the way the game goes on. But so talking about the gap between two doses of vaccine, Currently, two doses of Covishield are being administered at interval of 12 to 16 weeks. UK reduced the gap between two COVID vaccine doses from 12 weeks to 8 weeks on finding that the new variant could blunt the effectiveness of the vaccine. According to the Lancet report and various other institutes, the gap between the vaccines should be shorter for better efficacy. According to you, what should be the ideal gap between the two doses of vaccine? Any vaccine or a particular vaccine. So I'll tell you what I meant. So as of now, <clears throat> uh, you know, when we started off, we had only two vaccines. We had Covishield and Covaxin, right? And the initial recommendation that the second dose should be taken about 
four weeks after the first dose. Right, one month. In fact, that's what we all took, and we took COVID shield at that point in time. The confusion came that after a while they found that in England, the studies showed that if you take the second dose after a longer gap, maybe three months, then you are able to achieve better antibody response. And that was the reason why I mean, there must have been many other reasons. The fact is that the vaccine was in short supply. You had to cover as many people as possible and so on and so forth. But then people felt that, look, I think increasing the gap between the two doses might give you good protection because you will get better antibody responses. Right? And even after one dose, you are getting some degree of protection. So it is not that you're not getting any protection at all. That's the reason why there has been a to and fro uh, change in uh, advisories regarding what should be the timing for the second dose. So India also went in that direction. And therefore, whatever Indian government said pertained more to the Covishield vaccine rather than the Covaxin. The Covaxin has more or less remained steady that the second dose timing should be four weeks after the first dose. And I think the Sputnik V, the recommendation is now three weeks after the first dose. Okay, but one must understand, and especially the audience here, because I believe your audience is a very learned audience. Earlier on, when Sputnik V was being used in two doses, it was the same vaccine given in two doses. So first dose, and after a gap, the second dose. Now, the present Sputnik V has a different vaccine for the first dose and a different vaccine for the second dose. So it is not that the same vaccine can be used for the, either the first or the second dose. So that has to be understood. And they have actually reduced the gap to three weeks. And they're, of course, trying for another vaccine, which is called the um, Sputnik Light, which is they're trying to make it into a single dose vaccine. So, but there are there is a lot of confusion that the gap should be reduced for COVID shield because more we increase the gap, difficult it is for us to fight the Delta variant. Is this I would agree. true? I would agree with you. See, why is there so much of a hurry and haste that we must try to roll out a very effective vaccination program and cover as many people as possible? That it is not for individuals alone, it's actually for the population also. So if you are quickly able to pop, you know, vaccinate a large section of the population and build their herd immunity, you might actually be able to control the epidemic or the pandemic. If you go too slow, then you are giving the virus more chance to mutate. And therefore, you know, you are actually almost in a way encouraging nature to create another experiment. And that's the reason why if you are able to vaccinate more quickly, get more antibody levels, prevent infections, therefore reduce transmission, the better are the chances that you might be able to control the outbreak. But sir, do you think it is a wise move to increase the gap if we have shortage of vaccines, even though we that's know that a shorter gap would be recommended? So that's a political I mean, okay, let me put it this way. So already the government has made an allowance that for people who are traveling overseas, they have said that you can actually take the second jab after four weeks of the first jab, which basically means that they have looked at the safety that the jab, second jab at four weeks is not bad at all. Okay, So from that point of view, it's between the devil and the deep blue sea. If you take it after three months, you might get better antibody levels, but you have less protection in that interim period. Whereas if you take the second dose at one month after the first, your antibody levels will, may not be as high, but it will still be far more respectable. And therefore, you are getting an early protection from catching the virus. Thank you for clearing our doubts, sir. My next question is, it has, fine, it has nearly been five months since India began its vaccination drive against COVID. And Indian government has still not allowed vaccine for pregnant women. Pregnant women were not included in the original clinical trial to test COVID vaccines for safety. Though the data from around the world shows that vaccines are safe, question is, 
is it the shortage of vaccine or are indian covid vaccines really unsafe for the expecting women indian vaccines are not unsafe from that point of view but you know what happens is when you start rolling out any new therapy or a vaccine you have to keep trying it out in different specific cohorts for that matter that's why when vaccination was rolled out all over the world it was primarily done for adults first the 60 plus who were more vulnerable then it was the adults and if you saw carefully children are the last ones to be include, included because you know you don't want any harm to come to children and pregnant women because there are two sections which are considered to be the most vulnerable sections okay so now uh, as you know the pfizer vaccine trial has started for children above the age of 12 or 13 and you know they'll have to prove that it's effective and in india the covaxin trial has started for children above the age of 13 so the government and the regulatory authorities will be very carefully looking at the safety data and safety is more important here the safety data before they decide to lower the age for trials and then use it for these two vulnerable sections so one would be children and the other would be pregnant women so i think that's the way the sequence of trying any drug or vaccine normally happens the most vulnerable sections are the ones which are kept last because you first want to establish their safety in other sectors i'm so sure it's going to come to children and pregnant women so we just talked about vulnerable section but i would like to discuss comorbid patients as well because these questions keep coming again and again should vaccine be recommended or prescribed to people who have diabetes who have lung infection who have asthma etc answer is you know when we say comorbidities we tend to club everything together one has to look at it a little carefully so people with hypertension stable hypertension people with diabetes stable diabetes should they be vaccinated the answer is obviously yes because if they contract covid they are at the highest risk of tumbling down into serious or critical disease and dying so they need the protection much more age is the other one obesity is the other one okay asthma is certainly an important uh, variable in the sense it's a comorbidity because if an asthmatic catches a chest infection he is obviously at a higher risk of going down okay so these are the people who need the vaccine the most and therefore they are not contraindications contraindications would be the people who have a known history of anaphylaxis so you know severe reaction so always you know vaccine is you are giving a protein into the body and if they have anaphylaxis it can be a problem so even then i would say it's a relative contraindication one has to do it with a lot of care make sure that it's not done very easily and you have all the requisite uh, crash board available and so on and so forth uh, the other group which is which comes in is basically people who are on anticoagulants now you know in public life i find that people confuse antiplatelet agents with anticoagulation so a large number of people who have diabetes hypertension and who have had a stent put or whatever they are on these drugs called low dose aspirin or clopidogrel so they are called as antiplatelet agents they should go and take the vaccine actually that is not a contraindication at all the contraindication if at all and that's a relative contraindication it's for people who are on medicines like acid trom you know where the blood is literally made thin and it doesn't clot and the reason is that if you take a intramuscular jab it can produce a local blood hematoma you know that is a collection of blood there so even for them it is not a complete contraindication they need to discuss with their doctor and need to possibly stop their acid trom or blood thinners for a while and then take the jab and then restart so this was quite a new information for the audience yeah. that yeah. there is a difference between comorbidity contraindication and people who are taking coagulants <laughs> so my last question to you final question uk is in the early stage of third wave once top scientists south africa enters third wave 
of coronavirus positivity rate reaches 15.7 and experts in india have also raised the possibility of a third wave of the pandemic can we have your expert opinion on the lessons from the second wave that our audience should bear in mind to prevent the third one is vaccine hesitancy posing an obstacle for the preparation of third wave so the second part of your question first vaccine hesitancy i think that you know at this point uh, most people across the world are agreed on one thing that if at all there is some way of trying to curb this pandemic uh, it is through rapid vaccination of a large number of people and the, you have to do it rapidly if you do it slowly then you are actually giving more time for the virus to keep mutating and therefore changing its color and the protection levels come down so i think a rapid vaccination would be useful and let me give you examples obviously the two countries that come to mind one is of course uh, england that england decided to almost reopen because they went on a very crash vaccination program but the other country which has done even better is actually israel i hope you know israel has actually vaccinated more than about 60 to 70% of its population so people are able to go to restaurants and you know they're not wearing masks and life is almost back to normal there's one other country in europe i think it's serbia which has gone uh, gone the same way so these are very stellar examples india na, one of the problems is of course that we have a huge population so at this point in time the number of people the proportion that we have been able to vaccinate has been around 5% so others have gone to 65 70% so obviously it's a logistic issue that you know how do we get so many vaccines how do we reach out to so many people and we vaccinate coupled with that there has been this little issue of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine hesitancy comes from the fact that you know maybe some of these adverse effects of vaccines are blown up in the media into such an extent that they are not put in proportion to what would it be had you not been vaccinated that is the risks of the covid vis-a-vis the risks of the vaccination so the common person tends to get very scared then of course there are other political reasons for it and i hope you know the last controversy that has crept up yesterday was something to do with what is the source of material in which the vac- the virus is grown from where the vaccine is made so it adds a religious intonation to it so these are some of the problems that you know we have to learn to overcome and therefore what i feel is that it's not science alone and it's not the government alone which would work you require a very good strong civil society with a strong voice to be able to convince people as to how to go forward and trying to tell them the value of vaccines or oh, by the way a whole lot of my patients who come to me at a particular segment they are worried that some of people have told them that after the vaccine that they would become infertile and that is yet another thing which is going around now there is no evidence for it but the fact of the matter is that you do need a very strong voice which would actually have to convince people that look this is the best bet that you have and you might as well take the vaccine shots on time and go ahead it with regard to the third wave yes we are all worried to be honest nobody can be complacent anymore because the second wave took all of us by storm and i think that you know we everybody thought we had won the war which we hadn't and you never know what can happen with the third wave so my suggestion is that even if you have taken the vaccine and the numbers keep falling on the television screens please be discreet the virus can still teach us lessons i think that wearing the mask using social distancing not going out in groups and gatherings you know crowds i think you know we should still learn to be a little discreet for another 6 months to a year before we say that where the third wave is and how it's going it's not so, easy message to the audience is be discreet even after getting vaccinated so if time permit can we take few questions from our audience sure i'm up <clears throat> so uh the questions are let me just go through them um, 
Hello, doctor. My brother had COVID nineteen and got plasma therapy in December. Now he has recovered and CRP is two point five. He is a sugar patient. Should he go for vaccination? If yes, any medical precautions he should be taking? I think his antibody levels will anyway be high, so he is not in a hurry to go in for vaccination. But if three months are over. I think he should go in for a for a vaccination to boost up his antibody levels because Second, after all he has COVID. It is yeah. Will the risk of severe COVID nineteen more for celiac patients who are not yet diagnosed of the gluten issue and are not on gluten free diet as compared to celiac patients who are already on GF gluten free diet. Hello. Uh, sorry, so, so severe patients. No, you avoid me. Will the risk of severe COVID nineteen more for celiac patients? Hello. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, there was a connection problem. So celiac people are. Uh, you know, it is one of the comorbidities, but not the frightfully important comorbidity from the point of view of contracting COVID in that sense. Unless you know he's a completely uncontrolled uh, celiac who is very emaciated, and you know his energy levels are down, and his hemoglobin and iron is uh, terribly down. Uh, but yes, I think with regard to the vaccination, they should get vaccinated, and they should protect themselves. So we have another question: What should be the gap or time period for intake of alternate vaccine? For intake of what vaccine? Alternate vaccine. I'm assuming the person wished to take another vaccine. So what should be the time period between the two? You know, I think it will. Uh, we will probably come to that anyway. And the question is that you know, let's wait and see how the thing evolves. So when we started, I think uh, in January this year, uh, we were offered. Uh, there were only two vaccines, so we had Covishield and Covaxin, and Covaxin was in short supply. Now these are the two. Now we have got a Sputnik V vaccine which has come, and now there are two or three other companies which are going to come in. So we are going to have a Zydus vaccine, and then we are going to have probably one of the two Messenger RNA vaccines. Now. If you are reasonably well vaccinated, that you know you have taken your two doses of any of the vaccines, and you are not a high risk person. You know, when I say high risk person, I would say that we, for example, healthcare workers, we are at high risk because you know if you look at uh, doctors, there are 730 doctors who have died in the second wave alone this year, and uh, last year there were about a thousand doctors who died in India. And I'm talking about Indian figures. So, because we come in contact with a lot of people, we are at high risk. But I think for all others, you are at reasonably the average risk, you know. So, I think we should wait, and in another two to three months, we will have an array of vaccines, and the options that will be given to us will also play out. Because as of now, there are a lot of restrictions. You have to use your Aadhaar card, go and get it done. And people will ask you, how can you ask for another vaccine, and so on and so forth, because it's not a free market vaccination program as of now, because it's in short supply, and the government is trying to do its best. So it will evolve a policy which we will all have to abide by. But after a while, when things become a little more easily available, and then the values of a third vaccine, and if so, which one, and so on, evolve a little better or become clearer. Then things will be better, but it will be difficult for me to speculate at this point. Can a patient with one kidney take vaccine? Yes. My antibody, my antibody's level is twenty two hundred. Do I need to take vaccine? Uh, if you have already taken the vaccine, maybe one or two doses or whatever, and or you have got COVID. I don't see the frightful hurry to take a vaccine right now. But I hope that there are there is a clarity I need to bring to the audience. There are one is called the 
covid antibodies and then there is another type of test which is called a neutralizing antibody so you know the neutralizing antibody is the one which gives you protection so it would be good if you have any doubts or if you are a healthcare worker or a high risk individual to make sure that your neutralizing antibodies are adequate i am having sore throat from morning nothing else can i have vaccine in the evening uh two questions for you one is have you had covid in the past if you had then this is probably the weather and you can if you haven't had covid and you are having sore throat i would advise hold on get a covid test done or let's see how will you be uh, feel tomorrow and then take a call the reason is lot of people na they have gone in for the vaccine when they have had early symptoms of covid and then they have developed covid say on day 5 or so and then they have blamed it on the vaccine telling that you know i got covid after the vaccine so that's actually a confusion another question my grandma was not vaccinated before getting infection post covid we did blood test crp was 13 hemoglobin 10 we are not sure if we should now vaccinate post infection in this condition ask them to get the covid antibodies done and if suppose they are high i would say that you know if she is very old and frail you can hold on but at least after 3 to 4 months giving a safe vaccine may be a good idea thank you so much sir for taking the questions of our audience what would be your final message in one statement to our public the message is that you know there is nothing very certain about covid as of now we are all going through a phase of uncertainty both on the medical front the social front and every other front so therefore whatever i say today i may be proved wrong tomorrow but remember that you know this is a evolving time keep your antenna up keep listening to what is happening observe what is happening in the world and you know this virus is going to teach us many more lessons before it finally fades it's not going to be a easy work thank you so much sir it was lovely to have you on the show i hope our audience is as enthralled as i am thank you